Good evening, everyone. Tonight we have one of the biggest questions uh, to deal with that the world has ever asked. What is the meaning of life? You might, and you may ask, <laughs> well, hang on, who is this bloke? And, and how is he qualified to answer questions that has philosophers arguing for hundreds of years? That would be a very good question. <laughs> but it doesn't take a genius to, to examine the common ideas that philosophers have about the meaning of life and to use logical thought to come up with a conclusion. There's a lot of ways that you can interpret this question. What things can I do in my life to give it meaning? Is there an intrinsic purpose to life? Is it all just pointless? Is life's meaning up for us to decide? Or it can be, why am I here on earth? What's the purpose to all of this? Why is there life on this tiny speck in the universe? And at some stage, I'm sure that all of you will or have asked at least one version of this question. So let's get to it. And, and firstly, I, I just want to apologize if it comes across a little heavy. Um, the language that I've had to adopt was from philosophy and uh, not necessarily words that I would use. So uh, hopefully, we can, uh, we can all follow along without too much confusion. Okay, what is the meaning of life? Well, I think it would be silly of me not to look at this subject. Um, sorry, to not look at this subject um, from the perspective of the accumulated knowledge of the philosophers. They've had this discussion for a hundred years, hundreds of years, surely they've got something good to say. And there's roughly four main ideas on the meaning of life. And just for interest sake, I got this, um, this information off a gigantic essay written in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy by Thaddeus Martins, who cited over 130 different sources and philosophers. As you can imagine, it was an incredibly interesting read. Now, his research, I thought, was better to be used because if I was to spend all of this time summarizing the, the main theories, I, I wouldn't have come up with something that was as clear as his. So I'm going to steal his information, if that's okay with you. And from his paper, one thing is abundantly clear. There is significant disagreement over this topic among the philosophers. And, and many people actually ascribe to one or more of these ideas, or they combine them. These are smart men and women. But at the end of the day, we, we all approach this subject with our own worldview and biases. The four main ideas on, on what provides meaning in life are broken up into two different categories. And we're gonna go into every one um, briefly. If I can, there we go. The first two are under the, under the title supernaturalism. The idea behind supernaturalism is that meaning in life is only possible with some sort of connection with the supernatural. What is that connection that you have with the supernatural and what is it that you're connecting to? Well, that's where the disagreement occurs. And there's two main arguments on what you're connecting to. There's the God-centered view and there's the soul-centered view. Those that, uh, those that hold to the God-centered view believe in a spiritual being who is all-knowing and all-powerful. And it's only because of God we can have meaning in our life. This God has, has some kind of purpose, and it's only this purpose or plan that brings meaning into our lives. So what is it about God and about his purpose and, and plan for the universe that makes him so uniquely able to bring meaning to our lives. Well, some argue that God has given us immovable moral laws without which our lives would be rendered nonsensical. Well, I, I stole that quote. It's not something I would say. But basically, without morals directed by a perfect being, we would be living any way we want, which would bring chaos and destruction to the world. Others argue that being created by God is the only way our lives have meaning. 
if there is no God, if we're just random proteins that happen to get together, it's only time and chance that we have. And so there's no point or plan to the universe. And one more argument I will mention, it's, it's the idea that God is infinite. Our short lives are, are unimportant in the face of something um, like the universe, the vastness of the universe. And so our lives can only hold value when they're connected to something that is not only vast like the universe, but infinite, something that's outside of time and the natural laws, and that is God. And they say, so by our connection to God and his awareness of us, we gain more purpose, more value and meaning. One of the main um, philosophical arguments against this idea is that for God to be the only source of meaning, he must be completely different from us. Why? Well, because the more like God we were, the more reason that we would think we don't need God to have meaning. Okay, so if it's, if it's only through God that we can, we can have meaning, he would have to be incredibly different from us. Yet the more God is unlike us, the harder it would be for us to relate to him. And so if we can't relate to him, how can he bring meaning to our lives? And that brings us to the second supernatural theory of what brings meaning to life. And that's the idea that humans have a soul and that being connected to this soul on some level gives life meaning. Relating to this immortal spiritual substance that, that's part of our body and will, will outlive our death is what brings meaning to life. And although it's often linked to the idea of God as well, it, it's often, it's a commonly held idea just by itself. And again, there's many reasons why people hold to this idea. Some argue that for life to be meaningful, something must be worth, worth doing. But they say nothing is worth doing if it doesn't make a permanent difference to the world. And they say the only way for it to be permanent is by having an immortal spiritual self, a soul that will live forever. The second idea is that, that meaning in life can only come from perfect justice. It's, which is only possible if you have a soul. So the only, the only way it makes sense or, or it's fair that bad people can prosper now and good people can struggle to get by is that if there's something beyond this world that sort of balances out, wrongs are set right, if a good person by their actions and their connection with their soul can live forever and a bad person because of their actions cannot connect with their soul. The most obvious argument against this is that, yes, having a soul would make you immortal, but having a soul is not necessary for immortality. So even if you do believe that being immortal is the only way for wrongs to be set right, or, or our actions to have a permanent effect, it's clear that you don't necessarily need a soul. And so that's, those are the basic arguments made by those who believe life can only have meaning when connected on some level to the supernatural. And that brings us to the second group, the naturalists. And these people really love to add ists and stuff like that to the end of words. Take it away and, it's, and it makes a lot more sense. You've got supernatural versus natural. Naturalists believe that even if there's no spiritual place, no God, no higher power, no soul, nothing, meaning in life is still possible. Like supernaturalism, naturalism, <laughs> naturalism is also broken into two, um, into two groups. The first one is, is called subjectivism. It's the belief that, that meaning in life is subjective. It's based on your personal belief. So if you believe something to be important and you're able to do it or you achieve your goal, that brings meaning to your life. It's the idea that if, if you care about things, you love things and you, and you achieve those goals or you have sort of a relationship with the things you love, that brings meaning. 
And I'm sure well, I've heard it a lot. My dad used to say this joke a lot. Be true to yourself. He was joking. But this is an actual idea that people hold. And it's rooted in subjectivism. That being authentic to your true feelings and goals brings meaning. But what if your whole life goal is to drink the muddy pond at the back of your house dry? Every day you go out there and you drink three cups of water and you plan to drink that every day until the pond is dry. Unlikely to be your or my goal, I'm sure, but it proves the point that not everything humans may focus on brings real meaning. And that brings us to our last idea, objectivism. As you might guess, it's, it's almost the exact opposite. Meaning has nothing to do with what you or I hold as important things in life. Meaning in life, they say, comes from certain things that are inherently worthwhile. They claim that, that, that these are actions that in and of themselves bring meaning to life, even if you don't enjoy doing them. For example, they claim that living a moral life and living creativity, creatively are actions that we can do that bring meaning to our lives. Whereas watching grass grow or, or clipping your toenails do not bring meaning as much as you may enjoy them. It's, it's actions and goals and ways of living that are meaningful, regardless of any individual. This is what they say. It's, it's meaningful regardless of any individual, society, or God's thoughts on the matter. They provide meaning of themselves. And the biggest problem with this idea is how does anybody know what these goals or actions are? They're defined as being meaningful in and of themselves, regardless of anyone else's opinion. So yes, philosophers may have come to a consensus as, as to what some of these actions are, but that's just society's opinion. And if it's just opinions deciding these actions, then it's no longer objective and unchangeable because objective goals and actions will be different in different cultures all around the world. And so if these goals and, and actions can be different, they're not objective and unchangeable. And so these are the four main philosophical, <laughs> philosophical arguments about what brings meaning to life and, uh, and the arguments against them. Yeah, I'm going to do that probably again. I, uh, I've done that at least three times while reading. I was hoping I would be able to concentrate and rein it in, but no. As we opened with a prayer, you probably clued into the fact that my bias is, uh, is towards a God-centered view of what brings meaning to our life. But I think it's important to realize that I don't do this blindly. It's a view that I developed with, from, from hours of study and research into archaeological evidence. And is the Bible historical and accurate? And from that came a growing appreciation of impossible prophecies that came true. And I don't expect or want you to take my word for it, but to research the validity of the Bible for yourself. And, and, and before you say, oh, it's not real, go look into it as unbiased as you can and prove to yourself before you blanketly state that God and the Bible is just made up nonsense we tell ourselves so we feel better. For me, my conclusion was that this book cannot have been made by man. God is real. When you think about it, it sort of does make sense if, if God is real, that he would leave the Bible. If I was to bring about life on a planet, unless it was for some sick experiment, I would probably leave them with some sort of instruction manual, something that laid out my plans and, and the reason or the why I brought about life. And so I do not claim to personally know more than these philosophers. Obviously, they're very smart individuals. And, I, and clearly, I can't say the word philosophical, so I'm not. But as I pointed out, there's numerous arguments for and against almost every single um, idea or claim they have on what brings meaning to life. What I do find fascinating is that 
in reading the Bible, a book that's far older than any of the philosopher's writings, we have a definition of the meaning of life that beautifully combines these four main theories, um, obviously with, with slight differences. I don't think we need a philosopher to tell us that we can find joy and meaning in life by having a love for activities and people in our lives. Just think of when you're a kid, was the pursuit of, of grand ideals the thing that made you want to get out of bed in the morning? Or was it because there was a huge snowfall last night and you wanted to go out and play? The things that get us out of bed that we enjoy doing, the people that we love, can bring us so much meaning in our lives. In the Bible, there's a, there's a record of a man named Solomon. And he was a king of Israel who was incredibly smart. And, and because of his intelligence, his reputation spread throughout the whole region. And he wrote a book called Ecclesiastes, and it's in the Bible. And in Ecclesiastes, he, he talks about his experience of, of trying to find meaning in life. That's what the whole book is about, finding meaning in life. One of the main pieces of, of advice he gives, he repeats five times. <clears throat> he says, and I commend joy. For man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and to drink and be joyful. For this will go with him in his toil through all the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. So Solomon's advice is, is joy is the best thing we have in this life. There's nothing better than it. Eat, drink, and find things that you love. Find people you love that make your life better, that bring you happiness. But there's a few mistakes that we make when we're doing this. The first is, is seeing someone else's life and becoming jealous or bitter about our own experiences. And the second is, is searching for joy in the wrong places. I think all of us at some stage have looked at the lifestyles of the ultra wealthy, the incredible holidays. Maybe it's the parties, the fame, the houses, the cars, whatever it is. We think to ourselves, my life would have so much more meaning, so much more joy if I had what they had. But some of the most sad, most lonely people in the world are those who seem to have everything. And Solomon was one of these people. He attempted to find joy and meaning in the wrong places. And this is what he records about trying to find meaning in his life. He says, I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born into my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than anyone who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines the delight of the sons of men. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my, my wisdom remained with me and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward. Pleasure was my reward in all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil, the work that I had expended in doing it, and behold, it was all vanity and striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. So this man lived an incredible lifestyle. He had everything he could ever want. And he didn't, it says he didn't deny himself a single pleasure. And yet he concludes after all of this, after all of this effort, my life was pointless. He says, trying to achieve happiness and meaning through pleasure was like trying to bottle the wind, exhausting and pointless. The third problem with people or things we love bringing meaning into our life 
is that as Solomon goes on to talk about, life is temporary. Things change. What once brought us incredible purpose and meaning to our lives suddenly means less and less. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's mental health issues. Maybe it's, it's maturity or a midlife crisis or a near miss that cause us to change our priorities. The things that bring us the most meaning are temporary and they can be taken away. Maybe it's your partner, your children, your parents that bring joy and meaning to your life. Maybe it's your job that leaves you feeling fulfilled. Maybe it's your ability to help people. Maybe it's your, your skill at a sport. Maybe it's family, money, working out, food, travel, relationships, careers. All of these things, of course, can bring a sense of fulfillment and meaning and contentment to our lives. They can be our biggest source of joy. But the problem is they can also be a greater struggle. What if our relationships break down? What if we lose our job? What if we have an unhealthy relationship with our body, but we're unable to break the, the cycle of shame and eating? The things that bring us joy and purpose in our lives can be taken away and they, they can be our biggest source of pain and sadness. Life has an expiry date. And so as, as much as, as what we love in our life can bring us meaning, it's not lasting meaning if it can be taken away. If death or, or other changes and challenges in life can take it away, then it's not lasting meaning. And this was, this was the idea that caused Solomon to say the following. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This is vanity and a great evil. What does a man get from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. So Solomon says, after working really hard, following the things that temporarily gave his life meaning, he realized, I can't take any of this with me. One day he would die and leave it all behind. And so that caused a feeling of despair to, to well up within Solomon. After all the long and tiring days and, and sleepless nights trying to achieve his goals, he says, what's the point? It's all going to mean nothing one day. And that brings us to our, our biggest realization of all. Death has no meaning. Death is incredibly sad because someone you loved who brought meaning to your life is, is no more. And obviously someone's actions that led to their death can have lasting meaning. You know, you think of a soldier or the police dying to save someone or, or dying to defend their country. On Remembrance Day, we remember the deaths of all those who fought. We remember what was brought about by their sacrifice. But death itself has no meaning. Because in death, there's no thought or pain, no longing, no pleasure. Solomon wrote about death and and how it impacted on the meaning of life for him. He said, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more no reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. He says, in death, we have no love, no hate, no envy, no knowledge or fear. Death is meaningless. It's in life and only in life that we can have meaning. Regardless of what we go through or what we lose, we can still look for and find meaning in the smallest things in our life. But death reminds us 
that meaning in this life is temporary. And that's where the idea of, of a God bringing meaning to our lives is clearly seen. We, have, we, we see a hope of temporary meaning changing to eternal meaning. God gave us instructions and his plan in, in the Bible, but he also gave us a list of objective actions that will bring deeper meaning to our lives. Now, remember how it was defined before? It's, it's, um, it's something that has value in and of itself. But th this is not a list of actions with inherent value that philosophers agreed on, but ways of living given by a being who is outside of time, who is powerful and loving. Who else but him could tell us of actions that will bring deeper meaning to our lives? And so what are some of the actions that God gives us as being inherently meaningful? Numbers 14, 21, early in, in the Bible. And God says this, but as truly as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of God. Now, what does that mean, filled with the glory of God? What, what is his glory? Well, we see from one chapter before, Exodus 32, that his glory is his character. And then it gives us a description of his characteristics. So with that knowledge, we can see what God is really getting at here. God says, I swear on my own self, one day the whole world will be filled with people who have my characteristics. They won't be oppressors or greedy, but they're people who act with mercy and kindness, who are patient, full of goodness and truth, who forgive others for sins against them. These are, these are goals or actions or ways to live that God says have inherent value, that bring meaning to our lives, regardless of, of whether we love to do them or not. And in fact, many of these things are very hard to do. And yet in our attempt to live them, we bring more meaning to our lives today. There's a few other summaries of objective goals given in the Bible that I want us to take a look at. Micah 6. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Don't become full of pride or of self-importance so that you only look out for number one and you refuse to help others, but rather see yourself in comparison to God. Realize that we are small and temporary and that only he can give us lasting meaning. Solomon ends his thesis on the meaning of life in, in Ecclesiastes, and he says this. He says, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or bad. It's very similar to the, to the verse we read before. Have respect and awe for God, you are mortal and you will die. Whereas he is God, our creator, and he is eternal and loving. So keep his commandments, Solomon says. Do what he's asked, for one day there will be a judgment. And he says the outcome of that judgment depends on your attempt to follow his objective actions or whether we choose instead to follow our own desires. And this idea of, of what we choose to focus on is picked up by Jesus. The benefits of, of choosing to follow God's objective goals or actions or way of life is seen when Jesus says this. This is in Luke 14. Jesus says, when you give a feast, invite the poor, invite the crippled, invite the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Christ says, helping people who, who can't give anything back to you is something that brings meaning to your life. But it's more than meaning. 
it can turn temporary meaning into eternal meaning. These people you are helping, he says, they can't repay you. They may not even know that you've helped them if they're blind. But God sees it and he loves it. And he can repay you for a life of love and service at the resurrection of the just. What does that mean, the resurrection of the just? Well, that's the answer to not just how do we find meaning in this life, but what's the purpose to all of this? What's the point of our world? We see from the Bible that God created the world for a purpose. What was that purpose? Well, one of those things we already looked at, to fill the world with people who have tried to live out his character. People who haven't just done things that instinctively please themselves, but who have gone against their natural feelings to forgive instead of judging, to show mercy to those who deserve harsh punishment, to show kindness even when you're pushed past your breaking point. But all of us will die. Mankind is mortal. And so God made a way for humans to be saved from death. A man named Jesus, who was the son of God, was born. Do you remember the main criticism of the idea that meaning comes from our relationship with God? The philosophical argument was that a God cannot relate to us or we cannot relate to him because he has to be completely unlike us. I, he has to be perfect, unable to sin and timeless. But the more he is different from us, the harder it is for us to have a relationship with him and get meaning from him. Well, that argument is invalid because his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, was exactly the same as you and me. He was flesh and blood. He was tempted in all of the ways that we are. But with one difference, he didn't give in. He never gave in to his own natural desires. He perfectly lived out the objective actions and way of life that God gave us to do in his Bible. And in doing so, he showed all of mankind what God looks like and how God acts. His whole life, he only did God's instructions and he died doing that. He died so that the rest of humanity could be forgiven, could be saved from death. Look at what Jesus said about why he came. John 10. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I came so that you may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus came so that we could have life and have it abundantly. But not just any life. An abundant life. Well, how do you get an abundant life? How does one have life in huge amounts? By living forever. That's kind of the most abundant life you could have. He says, this is life eternal, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Earlier in his life, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen God. He didn't, say to, he didn't say this so that everyone thought he was God, but rather if you saw him, you saw what God is like because he had the character of God. He had for his whole life forced himself to not respond to his own natural desires, but to live a life with far more meaning and to love his enemies and to do good to those who hurt him and to die for those who hated him. And so in learning of Jesus' life and how he lived, we come to know about God and his character and his love. Jesus says, knowing God and his son results in eternal life. Why? Because knowing them and what they have done causes us to try to live how they have asked. We try to show God's characteristics to the people in our lives. We try to help the needy. We try to show love to all like they did because of the appreciation we have for what they did for us. And that results in the most lasting and meaningful life. But won't we still die? Like we saw, mankind is mortal. Well, that brings us again to God's purpose. 
Yes, his plan is to have a world filled with people who act in selfless and loving ways. But there's more to it than that. His son is coming back to the earth to set up a kingdom, one that will eventually span the whole world. This will be a kingdom where all the corrupt things of mankind are removed. No more will one person be rich off the backs of thousands of people being paid less than a dollar a day. No more will there, there be the poor be oppressed. No more will there be people vomiting up food just so they can eat more, while others struggle to find a simple piece of bread. It will be a kingdom of, of justice and peace and love. And we know from the Bible, it says, eventually every human will be made immortal. And this is really as much as we know about the plan of, of God for us from the Bible. But before he establishes his kingdom, the Bible tells us that Jesus will come back to this earth and judge all those that know of him. We, we see that the dead will be brought back to life and will come to be judged by him. Judged by him. It sounds quite scary. But remember back to those verses we read. Christ calls it, sorry, it's called the resurrection of the just. He says, God will judge every secret thing, the bad, but also the good. Christ says, I came to give life and life abundantly. And so by his mercy and power, the Bible tells us we will be made into immortal beings. If we focus on objective actions and, and ways of living that God has given us in the Bible, not only will our lives now, currently, be filled with purpose and joy, but we will have a hope to never ever lose meaning in our lives. A hope of immortality, a time where we'll be perfectly reflecting God's character and carrying out his purpose. Who do you think will be we helping set up this amazing worldwide kingdom that Christ set up? Us. If we choose to follow after the things that God has said will bring meaning. We will be responsible for, def for defending the oppressed, feeding the needy, making the world beautiful again, teaching the world about God and the peace that he brings. So what is the meaning of life? The meaning of life is feeling the joy and the fulfillment, the purpose and peace that following God's goals and actions bring. It's eternal contentment and wonder. It's exploring the mystery of God and the impossible depths of time and space in the universe as we live forever, bringing about God's will. It's really up to us whether our life will be filled with temporary meaning or eternal. But only one way will really mean anything when we die.